Okay, so I, do you want to use this interval to ask questions? Or do you want to ask questions at the end? Hmm? A microphone? Okay, that's a good idea. All right. So thank you for coming back after the break. <laughs> uh, I, I think we have, let's see. Yeah, not, we're, we're almost halfway done, uh, more than halfway done. So uh, this particular slide has to do with that the historical treatment didn't require the healthcare team to make the difference. They had one therapy, which is plasma exchange, and that was it. TTP, HOS, we give you plasma exchange a week, two weeks. I've seen some patients three months. That particular patient that I knew uh, 10 years ago had plasma exchange for th two years. Um, HOS is a rare disease, um, and so it's important that as physicians we learn pattern re recognition. So, you know, if it, you've ever gone on a road trip and you say, well, I haven't seen a Volkswagen. My husband's a, a detective and he, he sees all these cars. Well, he's, I've seen 10 of them, 10 of them. I haven't seen a Volkswagen. And then all of a sudden I start to see Volkswagens, right? Pattern, I put that suggestion into my brain, like the mini Clubman. Right now, I, you're gonna see a lot of mini Clubmans when you travel. But that's the same as HUS. The, the medical students, the residents, the interns, the fellows, the doctors need that pattern so that they can stay on track. Now clearly there are patients that don't fit that diagnosis, they're a little bit unusual, but majority of patients you can make, you can see it. And in fact when I started with this, um, and the more I went to the conferences, I saw more TMA than I've ever seen before. So that meant it was there all the time. I just didn't look for it, right? I, my, I wasn't training my brain to see it. And as I told you, my, the, the fellows I train, because we're in an academic setting, I train them to see this, and they joke with me, like, you know, I've given them the, the Kool-Aid test, right? They drank it. So how, how do we clarify? What test does a physician use to clarify that a patient has atypical HUS. So we look to see that the patient has acute kidney injury. And one of the things as a nephrologist that you know, I underline is that I'd say for all the women in here, their serum creatinines, uh, and David, I'm gonna correct you, no, I think it was your wife, that made the normal range of a serum creatinine 1.8. That's actually really high for someone. So 0.8, serum creatinine is a measure of kidney function. It's a poor man's measure, but that's what we have routinely. 0.8 for a woman, maybe 1.2 to 1.3 for a man. Children are different because they're growing. We have a different measurement for them. And if you double it, so I have a creatinine of 0.8. If I go to 1.6, I've lost 50% of my kidney function. It's huge. So that's the biggest jump. That's the part we have to pay attention to. Not when it's 13. Of course, we want to pay attention to that, but we want the early times when I've lost 50%, because when I've gone up to 13, this is what I have left, right? A small piece. So it's not linear. It's a log, it's a, a, a exponential curve that goes up. Anemia, an LDH that's above the upper limit of normal. I mean, I have, this goes back a bit, but I've certainly had hematologists tell me, oh, it's not 2,000. Well, it doesn't need to be 2,000. Thrombocytopenia, low platelets. And what we've learned is that the platelet count can be just a 25% decrease from the baseline. Well, most of us don't know what our baselines are, right? Um, an undetectable haptoglobin, a protein made by the liver, a presence of uh, red cells that are chipped as they've been damaged by complement or from the blood vessel, um, a hemoglobin decrease by 25%, 
organ failure, and an Adams TS13 that is with an, within the normal range. So that's the array of um, tests that we have right now that we could say you have an active case of atypical HOS or TMA, but guess what? You could have three of these and make the diagnosis. And that's the part that's tricky because physicians have been trained that this means you need anemia, schistocytes, and acute kidney injury. If you don't have it, you don't have TMA. We've been trained to, to think like that. We have to retrain people as the science develops. So some patients start on plasma exchange. Anyone here start on plasma exchange? Okay, no? Yeah, okay. And that was the, what we had to offer patients, but we know from at least reasonable data that <clears throat> the patients that have plasma exchange do as poorly as those that don't have it. So, um, Plasma exchange can uh, make the medical team feel better because some of the numbers do improve, but the organ failure continues, and that's the tricky part with this. Now, <clears throat> uh, it's still reasonable in some cases, if you don't know the diagnosis, to start with plasma exchange. I wouldn't fault a, a medical team for starting, but if, when we think about the Adams TS-13, if that is within the normal range, we argue that, that it's not TTP. And TTP is the more common diagnosis for adults, less so for children, but it's still the more common diagnosis. And the therapies are different. So what is ecoluzumab? Um, it's a, an antibody, they call it a monoclonal antibody. Um, that means they are mono, one specific, um, and they're made by identical immune cells, and they're all clones from a parent cell, and it binds to the complement C5 protein and lasts about two weeks. Now, they have a new version that's coming available soon that lasts a month, so the therapy frequency will change. Um, how is it treated? Well, basically, uh, HOS is treated, uh, so basically that's what I was saying, that the outcomes are the same for those who had plasma exchange and those that didn't. I got ahead of myself. Um, how do, what do you see in patients? Well, and it, my patient that I just had um, in the ICU, she followed this perfectly. The platelet count normalizes and hers went boom and has stayed. Uh, reduction, if you needed plasma exchange, stabilization of kidney function about a month, and uh, stabilization of the red cells. So sometimes medical teams want the patient to immediately turn around. Oh my goodness, they're still having a seizure, they're still having this symptom, they still have hypertension. It takes time to fix some of this endothelial damage. But you can see some immediate response. At 26 weeks, which is almost six months, right? Uh, maintenance and improvement in kidney function, blood and platelet normalization. This is from some of the older data and sort of mixed population of patients that came later. They weren't diagnosed immediately. I think maybe this will change now that some of us are using EQ quickly, but nevertheless, it c can take time for the drug to take effect because if you've broken down the house, takes time to put the house back together, even if the fire was put out, right? Um, monitoring ecoluzumab therapy. I don't know. Uh, do you know if your therapy is being monitored? Yeah? Okay. So some people will look at the urine every time or monthly for blood and protein. Some people will be t have their kidney function tested. LDH, platelets, haptoglobin. Some will look at the red cells to see if they're chipped. Some will actually get complement mo um, uh, monitoring, not sure about the utility. And then monitoring off EQ, which is a, a, a different question. So in this room, how many have questioned whether they should come off EQ? Oh, let's do your question first. Um, as a care member, they come out of the 
the blood test, what I should be looking for that helped me understand that there's a problem. We have great doctors, and they called her and told her things that they saw that were in, um, the, this is what, not for where she need to adjust. But how do we know what we put to do? Well, it, so within the blood test, if they don't showing Okay, so as a caregiver, she would like to know uh, what should she look for in the blood test to help her, the person she's taking care of. Um, and if they don't share it with you, then you can give uh, approval for her. Oh, share. We can go online and okay. Okay, so if the, hem I can, the, if the hemoglobin was to drop, or the LDH, I mean, basically you should look at trends. So what if the, the LDH, every lab is a little different, so if I quote a number, it may not be in your range, but just to say your number is 280, 280, 290, 270, and then it's 350, and then it's 400. That's, not, that's a bad direction to go in. Or the platelet count always is 150, 140, 160, and then 110, and then 100, that's a bad trend. Blood in the urine without a menstrual cycle is not a good thing. Um, so, you, you know, and if you're alarmed and there, you know, it turns out not to be an, an, a real alarm, that's okay. You'll, you get to learn this. Blood pressure that's not controlled, you know, that had been controlled and now is not, it would be something to pay attention to. Um, a blood count that went now it was 12, 11, 8. What's going on there? Um, it could be iron deficiency, but maybe it's not, right? So look at the trends of your numbers and, and sit with the nurse or, and, you know, have them go through it with you. So how many have thought about coming off of EQ? We haven't thought about it, but we're being asked maybe a lot. Okay, that's fair. And you, th you thought, someone in here thought about it? My doctor suggested it. So I, I find it interesting that uh, the, uh, you know, the medical team suggests it, but what about as a patient? Have you thought about, oh, I want to be done with this? No. You are happy you have been saved, right? I, I, I'm there with you. <laughs> I am. Uh, so right now you can... Uh, you know, for patients, I've heard uh, some of the adult doctors say that they've had patients that are done, they're done. And they give them some dipsticks to check their urine. Um, there's something called urinary biomarkers, and they, they are signs and pr of uh, excess proteins from uh, damage in the body. And so some people are studying them. Um, large gap in the utility of these right now, I think. Um, at this time, there's no best evidence for therapy duration. So you have a urinary tract infection. Uh, I'm not picking on you, <laughs> you're just up front. And I say, I'm gonna treat you for 10 days. There's g guidelines for that. I said, oh, I'm gonna treat you for three days with Cipro. There's guidelines for that. I'm totally comfortable with that. But for this, I don't have a guideline, right? And I think I've said it at different lectures, and, you, and I, I believe it, that this is not for life. And if somebody says, you need to be on this drug for life, well, that if, could, you know, if I knew the future, maybe I could say that. But I don't. And I know that there's a lot of research going out there. So I just say, let's take it six months in a year. Let's see what happens. As the research evolves, what happens? And there may be something for you that would be different. Why not be optimistic? I think it's fair. But to say for a lifetime, that's such a really heavy thing to, to lay on a family, I think. Um, so it might be possible to discontinue. Um, with relapse, there could be serious consequences. And what is the guarantee of recovery that you're going to be rescued? Who has the lowest risk? Um, can we tell now from genetics, from the lab recovery, organ and renal function normalization, and maybe we, we know what the trigger is, we can take away the trigger. Reasons for discontinuation, well, I'm going to talk to you about a paper uh, at the end of this that is a research study going on in France where they have removed 
patients uh, or enrolling patients who come off ecolizumab. Um, they want to see, would you like to be part of an experiment? Maybe not. I don't know I would be. I want to wait for the experiment to be done, but that's okay. Uh, monetary? Cannot take that out of this equation, right? Everyone's looking how to cut costs. Have to be really careful because you say, listen, I know this drug is expensive, but all these ranitidines and treatment for reflux and some other medications cost a lot more because there's a lot of patients and not so many of me. Right at this point, I deserve therapy. Hardship, it's a big deal to go two weeks for infusions. Um, IVs, ports, that type of thing. Is it worth it? I think so, yeah. And listen, if it's going every month, it, the hardship is reduced by half. How many get home infusions? Okay, so that's uh, uh, more convenient, right? <clears throat> so therapy withdrawal. So this is some older data um, about four years ago that they had five patients. And patient one came off and relapsed at about a year. Patient two came off, relapsed at uh, <clears throat> 80 days. Patient three, a month. Patient four, a month. And this patient five didn't make it very far at all. And so, uh, and they had severe complications requiring dialysis and then were retreated. Um, Alexion is doing an extension study to see of how people are doing off drug. I don't know who, how many are part of the Alexion registry. Okay, so registries are very important for us to gather data because it pools from one city to multiple cities, so we have bigger numbers and power to be able to tell you something that's more meaningful. Um, but in this particular case, I would say that it was like flipping a coin, you know, whether you would relapse or not. The data was not there at all, and I wouldn't have advised any patient to come off. I didn't know. I, I just couldn't tell you. And one of the things that I think really uh, bothers me, like, is that it's a systemic disease. So, yeah, it, the kidney might be the second relapse, but it could be the stroke, like my patient had. Are you going to be able to rescue a stroke? I, if I have an MI, are you going to be able to rescue me? If I lose my vision, are you going to get my vision back? Those are the questions I would ask. You know, wh what can you rescue? Until you know, I'm not part of that experiment. Yes? Is there um, evidence of systemic damage that doesn't rise to the point where you're admitted to the hospital? You, like, like, you may be getting hurt by this disease and not really know it. And so if you come off, you may... So, I'll repeat the question before David reminds me. <laughs> <laughs> so is there sign... Are there, is there injury that they cannot detect that's ongoing but injuring you? Is that what you... Yeah, basically, if, you come, if, if you're asked to come off and you come off, you may go a year before you're readmitted, but during that year, you've got damage that's going on. Right. And so this ongoing damage where they, it's not obvious, but... Um, you know, how sensitive are the tests and being able to decide if you're relapsing? That's a really good question. And so let me go through this slide first, and, and I think I'll address your question. So don't let me forget. Um, and I've copied down, I don't want to make sure I get all the numbers correct. So I think um, this particular paper has been quoted a, a, a more than a few times. It's put out by the group in France, by Fakuri et al. He has done F-A-K-H-O-U-R-I. I have the paper with, if you want uh, to see it. I can give you the copy. This is the French registry that's essentially offering patients to be monitored as they come off ECU. And they had nine children, 
less than 18 years of age, and 29 adults. Um, all had renal function um, that, um, that was impaired going into this study, and none had secondary forms, meaning no patient went into the study that it had cancer, drug-induced HUS, autoimmune diseases. They excluded those. Um, or infections, that was the other group. So they put them uh, into two groups. Um, one, they had positive genetic screen, and another group had no findings on their genetic screen um, and, uh, for rare variants. So 21 patients had um, finding, genetic findings and the rest did not. Um, and all of them except one were heterozygote. Okay, so he, sometimes you, a medical team might say, well, it's not homozygous, so you can't have it. A lot of these patients, and 97% essentially had heterozygosity, meaning only one of those genes. Remember the, from that slide I showed you? 50% were on dialysis at the start before they were treated with ECU. And all had, had renal recovery with ECU, off dialysis. 12 patients, 32% had a relapse with the ECU coming off. So that's at a mean of seven and a half months. So they had, um, the major variants they found were complement factor H uh, mutations and another group with MCP mutations. That's essentially how it played out in their group. And then they had another group that had no detection. And so if we look here, this is a, a survival curve. The top line in 24 months, that's two years, the ones that did not have a variant, none of them had a relapse. But this, this shows you how many patients are remaining that did not have a relapse. And by the time two years have gone by, on less than 50% of the complement factor H and about 50% of the MCP. So that's pretty much like flipping a coin. Now, the main difference between the relapsers and the non-relapsers with their history of previous HUS episodes, uh, even before ECU use, um, and the frequency of their complement mutations. Um, so, they made a point that there were se several patients that, with MCP, because that is known in the literature to have more relapses, that when they biopsy the patient, this addresses your question, the patient had global gl glomerular sclerosis in some of the, the filters, and IFTA, which is fibrosis in the tubules. So, it did, you know, the kidney is, you know, if I put back my piece of paper, so when I had 100%, um, if I do that suddenly, the creatinine rises. But if I do it slowly, that kidney can go from first gear, second gear, third gear, and you can't tell because it can overdrive. You know, it may show protein in the urine, microalbuminuria, but you can have ongoing damage that you can't detect if it's slow enough. Quick, if it happens fast, th those mechanisms can't compensate. Um, so, yes. Um, the answer is, it could happen that you have smoldering disease, like we talked about. Is this acute, and when it's done, it's done? Or is it smoldering at some level that, you know, when you finally see it, you're like, whoa, I'm never going to get back to that baseline I had two years ago. Um, okay, so... Uh, The recommendation, and they have a, now a pathway, um, is that they feel that the patients that don't have complement gene mutations are reasonably uh, safe to come off, but with very close monitoring. And so that's a very vague de definition. How close is close, and how fast do I have to get therapy? 
So I don't, I, I wanted to bring this paper up because I think it's, you're gonna hear about it and physicians are gonna read it and your medical team might propose it to you. Um, and there may be a study in the United States that will, at some point, that might ask if you want to enroll in it. But clearly, I think the group that you know has a higher risk are the ones that have complement gene mutations, particularly in the cap C, you know the complement factor H and the complement factor I and MCP, etc. Um, what do you think? Any thoughts about this? Any questions? You want to come off? Oh, you don't want to come off. Yeah. Let's take a survey. Does this convince you to come off? How many says yes? Nobody. You're a good, good group. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. When you put it, I mean, we may be fighting this fight soon. That's why if you put it great, you know, how long it come from a stroke? If that happens. How are you gonna right, how will they monitor you that you're not have you know, that you won't have a stroke? Yeah. I mean it's possible you know, that they will want to put the reliability of the kidney injury, but the in the end you I think as a physician I know, if I was treating you, that I can't bring you into my office twice a week to monitor you. Right. If I you know, and, and maybe I could in the first three months. But by six months, you're get already getting tired of this, right? And you're going to say, I'm going to, I have to go on vacation. I have to go here. I'm too busy. And a month will go by. I haven't seen you. And something can happen, right? I mean, transplant patients are like this. They want not see the physician just once a year. But a whole lot can happen in a year. So, yes. Thank you. Yes. Some patients present that way. They're smoldering, low-level hypertension that's not detected, that's, you know, seems like the background. I mean, adult patients have it more difficult, is that correct? Have it, <laughs> because in the, you know, there's obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease in adults. And so you tend to blend into the background of chronic problems. And so what physicians see are people who have diabetes and hypertension from lifestyle issues and potentially some of their own familial components. But so you have to stand out from that crowd for them to pay attention to you. Someone had a question here. I talked to you this morning. Yes. Looking back. I don't know. I don't know. Right. So when you think about the patients with PNH, the, they they have uh, complement regulators that are missing from their red cells, lymphocytes, and platelets, and they also have problems with their bone marrow. You know, so that group, I would probably say yes. Uh, this one, I don't know the answer to for that. Yeah, and honestly, the only reason I had five bone marrow biopsies was because they had exhausted every other test trying to find out why I right. So I think we could take from this study, m in my opinion, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that there will be some patients that come off and some patients that don't. Right now, we're not sure. We think they're the ones that have the complement mutations. 
And let's wait. Let's see what the data comes out. Because we're going to be following this. Now, what should we monitor? So one of the interesting things I listened to recently was that the, when you get a dose of eculizumab, one, two, three, the way you process it is different. So some people will use up the ecu quickly, and others, that same dose will last them a month, and sometimes two months. But they standardize the dosing, so you get the same as you, and you get the same as you, right? Because it's easy to do it that way, and, and the, you're controlled. So when they stop at someone's EQ, do they know that they're really out of EQ? I mean, maybe they still have an effect for a while. It could be three months down the road. Or some, they've used it up, and by in a week later, they have no levels. So I think there's some monitoring that could go on. In transplant patients, we watch their immunosuppression levels. They don't have any, we adjust them. That's half of my job, is <laughs> adjusting tacrolimus. Measuring complement, free C5. So one of the other things that protects you from the complement uh, damage, it's that it's very ephemeral. It lasts just milliseconds. You have a, a lot of it when you need it, but it goes away quickly. So, plus you have those regulators. So measuring it is difficult. If you don't handle the specimen well, it's meaningless. So you have to, it, and it takes time, and most commercial labs can't do it. Uh, functional assays for complement. So there is, it's not available yet, but there is a lab that can take a cell and take your serum, put your serum in that, on those cells, and say if you have complement activation in your body. If it, they're hoping it can become commercial. So that would mean, I mean, I'm somewhat f uh, fantasyful right now, but you know, I'd have some kind of a dips, uh, like a, a, insulin, a glucose stick that I prick my finger, put it there, and I'd be okay. I'm all right today. You know, I, I, why not? Um, biomarkers, maybe so. Um, certainly show that in some patients. And the, the New England Journal, I think Alexian published in the New England Journal on this, where even a year out, patients with HUS had elevated biomarkers on therapy. So that early portion of complement, remember, ecolizumab blocks in the middle from the lower part. This early part's still spinning. And so they have some markers that show that it's very active still. How to end uh, therapy, taper versus stopping. Um, I can't, I haven't heard so much recently, but um, in a couple of years ago, I heard many physicians like to taper. The, the, like, all right, well, we are on every two weeks, let's give it every month, and then we'll go out to every two months. Um, for some patients, after two weeks, they have nothing, so tapering doesn't mean anything um, until you start mo actually monitoring the, 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 the drug level. Um, we don't know who's the safest patient for sure right now. And basically, now in the registry at 392 days, they still show for people who were, here they were, before EQ on dialysis, their kidney function improved, and that's 20% uh, change from baseline. So if you were on dialysis, that meant your GFR was from zero, or say 10 to 30 it still went up for most of those patients, even after two years, which is really reassuring, right, that uh, you can still have some repair. And this is just a slide to show you how fast the, um, this is from an eculism, uh, this was some plasma therapy, some improvement in the LDH, um, nothing in the platelet count, and this was the kidney function that was um, up to four, and this was in a baby. So <clears throat> with EQ, <coughs> excuse me, you can see how fast the platelet count rose. And the patient that I had, this is um, from the 2009, our platelet count went like this really quickly. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So kidney transplants, I think there's a, a few kidney transplants here. One. I know, two. Yeah, and uh, 
six months ago, a woman came from another place in Texas, and she had had twins, and had had kidney failure after her twins from atypical HUS. Her diagnosis was delayed about two months. She had genetic testing, and I'm not exaggerating, she had six genetic findings on her genetics analysis. She went in that city for a kidney transplant evaluation, and the transplant surgeon said, you don't have atypical HUS. I'm not giving you EQ for your transplant. So she came down to our center and was successfully transplanted. So, you know, there's still, this is six months ago. Uh, you know, I'd say this as a, a warning that you, ha you have to be your own advocates and your family has to be your own advocates. And this room, it, you become advocates for each other because you're resources for each other and your HUS foundation. I had the, two, the, the boys that came from Saudi, we did liver kidney transplants because we weren't sure that they could get therapy in Saudi Arabia consistently. So the liver transplant um, also, because that's what makes the complement proteins, can cure you from this too. But that, you know, to take out a normal liver is not a small uh, decision. So what are the risks to EQ? Um, the biggest one is infection, and how many know their vaccine status? Okay, so th the important thing is to get the meningitis vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine. And nowadays we're recommending the A vaccine and the B one, Bexero and, and um How often? So, excellent question. Um, basically, the package inserts every three years. Now, uh, at a recent meeting I was at, we know that in the general population, like for instance, in the, the A vaccine, there's A, W, C, and Y variants of uh, the men meningococcal uh, organism. And if I look, there's a paper that just came out for PNH patients that said that not all of them have good enough coverage of titers. We don't usually check titers. Um, the problem is, so I got very excited. So well, I'm, I'm going to measure the titers in my patients. Not a simple thing to do, first of all. And the second one, the ID specialist said, well, even in patients with low titers, we don't really know if that titer can mount an adequate response. It may be that they can. So the, the simple answer is get them every three years to the, uh, the package insert. Yes? Is it the same for infants or is it the same for infants as adults? So children have a different uh, set of vaccines they can get and the package insert would be the same. So the infants can get a simplified version and you say, why not just give them everything so they're covered. They don't respond. They don't make uh, the vac uh, an antibody against the full vaccine. So they have a, a special one, depending on their age group. Any other side effects? I think if I've been to meetings, fatigue is one thing that I've heard a lot of. Uh, and then there's some special ones that some patients seem to have, but w anything here that pops out? Uh, fatigue, would anybody agree? Uh, did you notice that with the, every time you get the infusion and it goes away? Yes. I have fatigue the day after Solaris. Yeah. All the, I have fatigue the day after Solaris uh -huh. and then it clears. Right. How many get their Solaris over 30 minutes? Over an, an hour? Two hours? An hour? Mm -hmm. So this is my patient. Um, this now, uh, she has a liver kidney transplant. And she had been on 57 months of dialysis and 27 months on the multi-organ transplant list. 
and she was five when she received a, a liver kidney transplant, and they wrote about her in the Pediatric Nephrology Journal. Um, she had a long journey, and she came before IQ, right? So we, and in a group that hadn't really had that uh, identification of what to look for. Well, it had been trained well to, to say he wasn't, right? You could argue it that way. So um, I think our journeys are, are very different. They've been complicated, and you look all very healthy, but probably not perfect, but better, much better. And so I'm really thankful for that. Um, I think time will expose what we need to know about this. And we have to be patient, and uh, it will come. And uh, I think I reveal one more, yeah. So if you thought it was a cat, it was a cat. So what about the future? Whoops. Uh, this is another video. It's not going to work. but. It's one of my favorite because these are all galaxies. Can you imagine they're all galaxies with thousands of stars, millions of stars? But, you know, the past decade, we have the complement inhibitor EQ, right? And PNH for 15 years more. So, you know, we're on solid ground that it works. But we're still at the very beginning of this new revolution of emerging biological treatments. And it takes a while, this slide, just to point out that you know, for other diseases, sometimes you hear, oh, this is great therapy, and it'll be in the literature, and then you don't hear anything. And five years goes on, and nothing. You're like, what happened? Basically, it takes a long time to get an idea out and commercially. A lot of regulation and persistence from preclinical to clinical development. And this is another recent slide from Seminars in Immunology 2016 that shows all the complement drugs that they're, they're, they're trying. Not all of them are for atypical HUS. They're for other parts of the complement system. But there might be, you know, combinations of drugs and others that will, you know, will come out. And these are in clinical trials. And so what I'm going to suggest to today, and I th uh, and I, some of you may have seen this or heard to do this, is that clinicaltrials.gov, you search for, I, this is, I searched uh, when I, at the end of last week. Um, these are study, centers that are, and studies that are recruiting patients. And this one here, let me get my, um, where is it? This is the registry of oh, this one here. This is the long-acting um, EQ, one month. The only thing is that it only is for patients who have not been on EQ. I don't know why exactly. I don't know the reason they decided not to include patients who have been on therapy. But um, they are recruiting for patients who have not been on EQ. So um, just to, you know, uh, you can keep looking at that and seeing what comes up because it'll tell you where and who's recruiting. And you might find something that uh, was interesting to you. Again, um, you may not. So on to the next. This is question period. And we'll go back to here. Is there something that can be 
done to make it maybe make the his treatment last a little bit longer. I mean, he's a teenager as it is, so he's moody, but it's really moody to where we can't stand him right now. Mm. So, have you um, told the your care team about this? Yeah, she just thinks that he's a teenager. I see. So sometimes you can measure partway through the labs and see if there's any change in the labs. I mean, that she has a, a, a large mood swing halfway through, I guess, one week into the, uh, the fe after infusion. Um, and it's pretty, pretty dramatic. Yeah. And consistent. Yes. Right. So uh, that's the only thing I, yeah, we got a bunch. Well, he, about day 12, starting on day 12, even the teachers notice. Oh. So he gets extremely irritable, starting about two days before infusion due. The next day after infusion, happy. Yeah. So we, I mean, even our teachers can see, even his right. teachers see So it, it, it occurs to me, if you came to me with that, I would say, let me measure some of the markers midway and it could be that you're, you know, as I said, the pharmacokinetics, meaning how you, ever, an individual metabolizes drugs, change with individuals and with age and with body mass. So, you know, the way I process it will be different than this. And they did, you know, one dose fits all, essentially. Now, the long acting monthly will be dosed by weight. So have a different dose. Um, and it's possible that, you know, he needs a different dose. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would explore it. And you, you know, and so if you could, hypothetically, you could say, let's do an experiment. Give, let's try a, bit, a, a different dose and see if it improves. Even if he's at the, the max, maximum well, amount? Well, people um, can get it more frequently, Shorten too. Shorten time span. Okay. okay. Could she shorten time span? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. She could sh because shorten the time span. And Sue could possibly address some of these mm -hmm. issues of how y your physician can go about um, writing justification for that. Yeah. I had one, the, one of the Saudi boys that came, he needed it every nine days. So. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Over there in, in the blue checked uh, shirt. I need Hands more questions. <laughs> more questions. <laughs> We're going to have a wireless one uh, That's fine. this afternoon. Hi, my name is Marco Lucero, and uh, I'm here for my son. My son has uh, had, uh, well, we was diagnosed like uh, about a year or two years? Two years. But anyway, my question is uh, on platelets. Uh, we're from El Paso, and there's a little girl that's the same age as his. And she started getting Solaris, and her platelet level just went to normal. My son is like stays in the 70s, 80s, hmm. and we keep asking the doctors, but they don't have answers for that. For two years, that he has had. He's had the. He was first uh, 50s, then 60s. Last year, all year was 70s. Mm -hmm. 70s. How old is he? He's four. Four. Uh huh. And, uh, they started with 300. Yeah, it hasn't improved from. What about LDH and other things? Do you know? Oh yeah, all that is it's it's good. It's Normal. perfect. Yeah, the, and no creatine on the protein. I, I mean, everything is. And the the blood count, the red cell count is. Yes, good? He, he's everything's fine. The only thing is the platelets. So. And they did the bone marrow, and he produces platelets. Mm-hmm. 60,000, that's okay. what, yeah. Right. Yeah, so it, it, it's within a safe zone, but it's low. Yes, yeah. that's right. what they tell us, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, so for, for every patient that's responded, like that, the two-year-old that you, you commented and the mm -hmm. patient I had, there are outliers that don't have normalization, but usually by a year they have. Two years is pretty unusual. <clears throat> so I, I would have to investigate further. Mm -hmm. I'd say it is unusual, and I don't have a, a direct answer for you. Um, and maybe there's a spleen involved. Do you know if there's splenic involvement? Uh, no, as far as I know, no. 
Does he have a catheter, a port? He has a port. All right, so sometimes there's consumption around the port. Um, I see that in dialysis patients a lot. That, um, and sometimes, I, uh, this, this is a very simple test, they have to do the platelet um, analysis in a special tube. Oh, okay. um, because if they don't, if they clump together. That might be an easy place to start. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so my name is Charlotte, and in relationship to the mood swing thing, um, what we kind of did was <laughs> to help the, the caregivers, we gave her another name. So when she starts acting like this, we'll call her by another name to get her to think, like, okay, calm down, Sharon, whoever you are, whatever. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, when, if I think of me, if I had a disease like this, we have a tendency as a to think too much. If people are sick, they at nighttime when they're laying there, they start thinking, or when they're looking at TV, they start all of a sudden they start thinking about this disease, and they might get frustrated. Out of frustration, you walk in and ask them a question, and they're already frustrated, so they lash out at you. But my question is, instead of thinking of it in this nature, are you saying that we should be more mindful of the mood swings to say, okay, this is an offset to something? Mm -hmm. So uh, Sue is back there too. I I would say from you know if it. In the clinical situation, if you came to me with that, I'd have to investigate it a little further to say, do you have enough coverage of the drug? As a side effect, Sue, what do you think? That's my, my work husband, by the way. Um, so in the PI, it doesn't really discuss mood swings as something that is a common thing. But one of the things I would tell you to do is, you all know, if you're on ECU, you know you have a case manager. And how they come up with things, new side effects, new anything, um, is if you talk to your case manager and just let them know that this is happening. Because we report everything. If you have a hangnail, we report it, believe it or not. When you call us and we do our out monthly outreach, and you say, well, you know, I fell down and bruised my knee. Yep, I have to report that too. Doesn't mean necessarily it's related to Solaris, but it's, it's kind of the reason why they discover side effects later on. It's kind of how they discovered, um, like with the fluoroquinolones, the Leviquin. So they found out later on that people can end up having Achilles tendon ruptures from those, that group of antibiotics. But you wouldn't think that that would be related to it. But it's kind of like that. So when you have things like this, just call your, call your case manager and talk to her or him. I don't want to be sexist anymore. Um, and just kind of say, you know what, I wanted you to know that this is kind of what we see because Jennifer and I talk about Garrett because Garrett's one of my boys. And you know we have we've made it made notes of this kind of stuff, and it's just kind of important to just kind of mention it. You know, I mean, everybody might be related, might not be, but if it's something that's happening, particularly as with kids as they grow, as their weight increases because their doses are weight based, it might be time to look at maybe upping a dose a little bit. You know, so but that's really all right. I have to. And, and I, I, I'd underline what you said that don't minimize that this is. Um, about a person's thinking they have a disease, let's pay attention to the symptoms. Yeah. And if you're not involved in a registry, you try and get involved in one. Um, another thing that you could, you could help, Alexian can help with, yeah. because that's really important to know um, what these symptoms are. Well, you will. <laughs> you will get one. I, right? Yeah, you, I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay? Here, Dave. Oh, oh, here you go. No, I just was going to touch base on something you said about like laying awake at night and thinking and having to do with mood swings. They can be very clinical symptoms, but also remember that there is realistic PTSD that comes with the diagnosis of a disease, not only for a patient, but for caregivers and siblings. 
one of the best things we did for my son when he started to act out about a year and a half into his diagnosis was take him to um, a child therapist who dealt with kids with um, different cancers and different diagnoses and and being able to work through like play therapy and things like that made a world of a difference and it doesn't work for everything everybody because there can be real clinical symptoms of it but just keep that in mind that it's that is another clinical symptom and that's something another resource to have in your specialist you know folder to talk to somebody about these different you know things you're feeling and whatnot because that can make a world of a difference in your everyday care. On the mood swing thing. <laughs> As an, I think as an adult patient, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I've been, uh, I'm going on two years, actually, I'm going on 15, but anyway, but at two years of diagnosis, I think sometimes as an adult patient, with children, you want to pay attention. I have three kids, and you're like always on it, but as an adult patient, I feel like sometimes, and I voice this to my husband, that you feel like you're whining all the time. If you have, I don't know if you guys feel that way. Sometimes you're just like, okay, I'm complaining way, way too much. And even as a caregiver, on the flip side of that, sometimes we're all human. I'm sorry, but we're all human. And as a caregiver, on the flip side of that, that's why my husband, he's like, sometimes, you know, I'll say something, oh, this hurts, or, you know, I feel like this. And, and he doesn't mean to do it, but sometimes you caregivers will be like, oh. like we hear it, because, because you hear it all the time. But I think sometimes that makes me a little more hesitant to say I'm having a mood swing or I'm having this or this happened. So that was just kind of my two cents, I guess. And he's over there mouthing, look at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. Yeah, it's like Marilyn was saying, it's considered a disability. And, but you have good days and bad days. And we still have that, you know, it's an invisible disease. And people look at you and you're like, oh, you look pretty healthy. But really and truly, you're not that healthy. Are people, other people talking? I'm having all my Well, she's making me feel guilty about calling her shame. But the pneumonia, the, the vaccine, pneumonia vaccine, you, it's a couple different variations. Do you, because of the saliva, do you su suggest a particular vaccine? So th there's Minotra and Be Dexro. Um, so there's two of them. Yeah. That, depending, I'm not sure where you live. Um, you know, in Texas, uh, the B is not as a significant component, but to me, why not? Just get an extra vaccine. Um, if you, I didn't actually mention this, but in the, the study of relapse, the patients that came off, one of them relapsed after the flu vaccine. I knew it. So the, the B, uh, the, the second uh, vaccine, the B1, it, uh, I think the, one, the group in Iowa say they, they wait to give that until someone's been on ECU for a, while, a couple of, like a month or something. And other places give both together. Um, that's just how they do it. You'd have to talk to your physician about high dose flu. Yeah, so that would be a personal uh, team decision to give you that. Yeah. I had a question. Um, so, on the lab levels, which my doctor doesn't check urine levels, so I guess I need to talk to him about that. But, um, the serum levels, is it normal? I've been getting it four months now. Is it normal for my MCV, my, um, the size of my red blood cells and um, the rate that I make them, is that normal for that to be uh, high? high? All right, so 
I can't tell you everything because I don't see the, the labs themselves, but if you have an elevated reticulocyte count and you have, you don't, so just your MCV is small, then you might need iron. Uh, you might need oral iron therapy. I don't have them check your iron stores. That's the easiest. I would say if I took a survey, oh, well, if I took blood from people here, almost everyone, including myself, is iron deficient uh, and vitamin D deficient. <laughs> Both. So. Well, you've been a, a wonderful group. I thank you. Did this talk sort of address the questions that you came here with? Or? Yes. I'm Charmaine, by the way. That's my twin over there. <laughs> We're a total opposite. <laughs> anyway, um, my sister is. Uh, on Solaris, the Solaris treatment. And one thing that is constantly in my mind is that it's so expensive. She has a really good insurance. And I just wonder what would happen if she lost her insurance or something um, happened where we couldn't pay for it. Um, what alternatives do we have? David, Sue. <laughs> and he's going to point that out again. Yes. So um, that's actually kind of why we have one source, Alexion. There's a whole team of case managers. All of us, we're all nurses. We are all really, really good at insurance. Um, the general feeling is that we can pretty much do anything with nothing, kind of like being a mother. You know, we would be, you would want to give your case manager a call if you had worries about expenses, if you have worries about what happens if. What I can tell you about Alexion as a company is that we keep very, very close track on insurance. Like what's happening in Washington, I know everybody's worried about that. We're concerned too, but we're like right up there. We're watching. We have an office in Washington who actually is on the hill all the time working with other organizations to kind of do lobbying for patients with rare diseases. We have a whole team of people. Um, if there's ever a change in your insurance, the first person you call is the case manager, the first person. Don't wait till all the other things have happened. You call us first. Because the earlier I know about something, the faster I can help it. Does Medicare cover this? Yes, 100%. Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurances. I don't know if, you may be aware, I think you would be, but we had our, one of our first patients, we could not get outpatient coverage for. Um, and it wasn't until we realized that the tex, state of Texas didn't have a typical HUS as part of their coding in the Medicaid structure. So I am a Texas case manager. I've been the Texas case manager since 2009. That was probably one of the worst things we ever went through, and it was because somebody pressed a wrong button in the Medicaid, Medicare system in Texas. They forgot. So what happened was anybody that was on Medicaid in Texas couldn't get approval for Solaris because it wasn't listed in the system. But like I said, we have a team. We have a team of access, we have a medical access team and they actually went and met with the director of Medicaid. They went and met with the director of Medicare. They lobbied and they got it corrected, but it took us probably about, not us alone, but it took us like six months to get it squared away. So we are not allowed to, the question was, could one source give her what she needed to file for disability? And the answer is, unfortunately, we can't help you with that. Um, there are certain parameters that we have to follow by regulation, um, and we can't, we're not allowed to help with anything like that. Um, what we can do, what you can do is have your doctor call the medical affairs department at Alexion, medical information. And sometimes they, if they may help them with some supporting information about 
you know, the medical disability boards may not know enough about atypical HUS, but if they have some good documentation, or they can give suggestions to your doctor to help you write the letter, because there's always, the doctor always has to write the letter. So we can give you something that would maybe help support your case, but the case managers can't do that. So, you know, I was turned down for a higher dose, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we went to Alexion, and they would not cover it, and Medicare would cover it. Unfortunately, I'm able to survive without the added dose, but is that just for elderly people that they will not? Med Medicare standardly will only cover a medication that is based on the prescribing information. So if it's 1,200 milligrams for a typical HUS, that's what they would cover, unless there is a really strong appeal by the physician. Well, with do Yeah. Um, it's, they will cover what the, what the dose is um, based on the prescribing information. Yeah. Painful. It is. Yeah. It's really, you, 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 it's, it's, um, while Medicare is, is really an amazing program, believe it or not, it's got its limitations and that's one of them. Um, same thing. Medicaid, I think, actually, believe it or not, is probably sometimes more approachable and you can actually get, it's easier to have that correct, that will give a higher dose or something. My doctor had uh, said that with Medicare, the more information you can get, if you just yep. pile it on them, that you can sometimes get it for. He's more. right. And which we didn't after that because I seemed to not get much more out of it. I got three doses of 1,500. Yep. And it seemed to be about the same. So I, I was really scared when they lowered it because I had a relapse. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm still kicking. So. You are still kicking. Anybody else want this? I could break into show tunes. No, no, no problem. I just have a uh, quick question on the medicine on the Solaris. Uh, I have nurses that cover the Solaris with that brown, comes with a Lysa. film. Uh -huh. Yes, and then the other nurses that take it off. Is it important to keep it on or? Light sensitive or not, Sue? I think it no. has to be refrigerated. That's the, the, to the, me, the, it, yeah, the constitution has to be done. Uh, with refrigeration under a special hood, but oh. not, I don't, it's not light sensitive. Not, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, you've been a wonderful group. I, I, I leave you with the, the opportunity to reach out to me if you need it. It's, I, I'm always available through email. Um, and I wish you well on your journey. I really do. Thank you.